When countries make economically irrational decisions based on politics or based on trying to prop up their own countries, people get hurt. People don't have enough money to pay for dinner. People are unable to have like good livelihoods across the world, but also in their own countries. For that reason, we think the best system is to make a perfectly economically rational system where we can have the most uh, uh, efficient access to goods, the most efficient production of goods and services. So what are we gonna stand for uh, in, in today's debate? We're firstly going to basically take the WTO model and extend that uh, to the entire world. We think that we would revamp the dispute settlement process and make it more fair towards developing countries, but we would also retain some like uh, sort of fundamental WTO rules that exist under the status quo. Like we'd say it's okay to have anti-dumping policies so that other uh, countries can't just like dump a lot of goods into your country. And we're also okay to have like sanitary and quality control requirements where a, where a country where a country can block uh, certain goods if they're like not sanitary, etc. We think that under extremely exceptional circumstances, countries could apply to the WTO to uh, allow them to have barriers. For example, if it's going to severely impact their food security such that many of their citizens will starve to death. But we think this will be an extremely high bar and it will be not be accessible for like just because you don't want to compete with other countries, it will actually have to be a massive security threat. I'll take a clarification now. Yeah, this is not a debate you need to have PR in this sports debate. You have to demonstrate reasonable ways this will actually occur. So your five-point model is not But my five-point model is the status quo, so I'm just explaining what happens in the WTO. Calm down. Okay, so firstly, I'm going to tell you why we think that under the status quo, the reasons why we have measures against uh, anti-free trade are uh, irrational measures that harm the countries that they come from. The first thing to say is that in a lot of developing nations, there is massive political capture by oligarchs that control massive companies and conglomerates. That means that the state, when, pro like, when providing economic policy, is coerced or, or, or sort of captured by that particular uh, company through lobbying, through things like corruption. So we think that when they're making those economic trade between like giving the sorts of companies subsidies, it's based on an influence that is not economically rational. It's not based on which company is going to survive and provide stability and economic growth for the country, but this person is my friend, this person has a lot of power, and this person is, is a friend to you know my powerful friends and family, and therefore I will give them massive government subsidies. That's really bad because it means that first that you don't have the stability that that country needs to have economic growth and security for its citizens, but also it probably artificially increases the prices because you're getting that government, sub government subsidy pumped into uh, into that, into that uh, company. We tell you in developed countries, there's also political incentives. So for example, there's things like the US-China trade war, which is just like markedly bad for the US economy, but has irrational political incentives to do so. But it's also things like your country, like having not enough geopolitical power, right? If you're like systemically locked out of free trade agreements, for example, you're a small nation in the Pacific, because you don't have enough leverage to get yourself into free trade agreements, like, like the TPPA, for example. Example, right? It means that you end up with less favorable deals and you can't actually, like, and, and there's a political reason you can't actually get the economic benefits that, like, would be the best for your country. So we say that countries act against their own economic interests when they when they pass anti-free trade legislation. So therefore, we say that it's actually beneficial for those countries, for the well-being of the citizens that live in it, to prioritize the economic interests and to actually uh, make decisions that are going to be better for their people. What is one of the ways that we say that this improves uh, people's well-being? It makes goods cheaper and more accessible. 
first reason is because companies have to compete on the international price, right? They can't just like shut out all the all, all the like goods coming in from China and then like boost up the prices of their own uh, like uh, c companies that are producing that particular product just because they don't have to compete anymore. That no longer happens. They have to compete on a global scale, which means for consumers they can then get that price, they can get that product at a at a lower price because if it is too high in their own country, they can simply import it from another country. But secondly, it takes the like quote unquote tax off of imports when a country like like basically has a levy on all imports coming in that is ultimately passed down to the consumer through pricing. We tell you that when that is removed, the consumer then gets uh, a, a cheaper uh, gets cheaper access to goods. But why is that actually really important? Because it's not just like a, a sort of abstract kind of thing, like, oh, the goods are cheaper, and that's a good thing. This is things like having the ability to not live in food deserts. It's things like having the, uh, the security of income, because less of your paycheck week to week is spent on food, and you actually have that disposable income to like pay your rent, or to, to fix your car if it breaks down, or to go to the dentist, or to, to take your child to the doctor. So it's things that very con concretely affect people's lives when they're able to get goods for a cheaper price. Secondly, what do we say this does specifically for developing nations? The first thing is it opens up these nations for like foreign direct investment. We say, why is that? Under the status quo, countries are able to prevent outside and, and foreign countries from coming in. But we tell you foreign direct investment is extremely beneficial for these countries. Firstly, because it provides cheaper goods they're able to like directly produce those goods in that in that country. They're very accessible, close to them, and a cheap price. But secondly, it provides mass employment for the people who are living like in these areas where there may be very very little uh, rates of employment, where there may be the, the alternative employment is very grueling agricultural labour. So not only do you get employment, you also get the skills and the upskilling that you get from working in a factory, from being able to climb the ladder inside of that country uh, c company, and getting the higher wage that you can spend back in to the economy. The third benefit there is it boosts the economy because you're bringing the capital from richer companies overseas and investing it into that business that exists in, in, the, in the developing country, but also, again, those citizens have higher spending power. Second thing for, for developing nations is that it reduces the like monopoly of, of regional blocks forming, right? Because big producing companies are able to form like regional blocks and geographically uh, like close areas, which lock out smaller nations from getting all of the benefits that these countries get by working together. We say that that's really bad, and we should include developing countries into those blocks so they can get the same benefits that those countries got by exploiting them through colonialism. We say it's okay to accept that there will be less local industries because we say that these industries industries are less productive, they are harder for people to work in, they're mainly based around agriculture and we're fine for them to give up this gruelling level of pay and, and rise to, like the rise of industry is preferable for these people to work in. Lastly, we want to say that this is a more efficient system so we think there'll be less waste and overproduction, we think that that's going to be good for the environment overall, we're very proud to stand. I've got a couple pieces of reputation to get to on the speech, starting off with the model. I think the model is very unfair right now, uh, and I'm going to address uh, specifically their idea that the uh, they're somehow able to be out whether or not corporations are going to be able to uh, dump a bunch of their industry into these nations, uh, whether or not the uh, third, like uh, the developing nations are going to actually be able to be heard in the WTO. We see that historically that is not the case, and I don't think they have fiat power to say, we're just going to rewrite how the World Trade Organization works. I don't think that falls under this motion, and I think it's unfair for them to say that that is the case, given that the, they don't listen to these developing nations when they're talking about how they're going to uh, regulate the economy, and they often don't even inform them that these discussions are happening at all. We don't think that's fair at all to the opposition side, uh, and I'm going to give a little bit of remodeling uh, what we think the metric is supposed to be, uh, and uh, we'll go from there. So they said that the metric is going to be what's uh, the best goods that you're going to be able to get, uh, the cheapest goods, uh, and how you're going to be able to profit the best off of this. Uh, we think that's inherently unfair to developing nations, 
Um, we think that a better metric would be what's best for the globe, specifically as it relates to these nations' economy and as it relates to their environment. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about economy and a little bit of environment, and Ben's going to expand on that. Uh, so getting into uh, some more reputation from their points. Uh, this idea that the tariffs are hurting the local economy, that the nation who imposes these tariffs is damaging itself. We don't think that's the point of tariffs. The point of tariffs is to foster local economic growth. And when you have a larger business outside of your nation that is able to come in and do everything at a cheaper price, we think that undercuts your business. That's why we put tariffs in place to encourage people to go local. Uh, so we don't think that's the case. Uh, second, this idea that uh, you're going to get cheaper goods because they're on an international price, uh, we think that uh, that, again, comes at the loss of your own economy. And I'm going to expand on that in a minute. Uh, this idea of foreign investment, we think, uh, isn't actually going to be beneficial to these nations. Uh, we think this is going to actually foster dependence and is going to uh, give the corporations and by extension the governments of the nations that are coming in and investing in them uh, more control over these nations because of their control over that nation's economy. Uh, finally, this idea that it's uh, somehow reducing monopolies. We don't think that makes any sense at all. And if anything, it's going to create global uh, monopolies where these nations are dominated by uh, the nations that are outside of them who have more money to uh, spend to undercut their industries. So getting into uh, our case on the opposition. Uh, we think that this is going to, uh, again, we think the metric is what is best for the globe economically and environmentally. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about how this destroys the local economy, uh, first in developed nations and second in developing nations. So starting off with developed nations, I'll take a POI if anyone has one before I get into that. Go for it. We think that, uh, well, I'm going to talk about developing nations uh, right now, uh, and then I think that a lot of the impacts are also going to, uh, like the benefits of that, even if there are any, are going to be overwhelmed by the uh, detriments to these nations that don't have that kind of spending power in the first place. Uh, so getting into how this is going to destroy the local economy of developed nations. Uh, we think that this happens uh, primarily through the outsourcing of labor. And so what does this look like? In the United States, for example, regulations are some of the strictest in the world. And so you are forced to jump through all these various hoops in the United States to get your industry to uh, do the things that it wants to do. Uh, you're going to have to uh, meet certain environmental standards. You're going to have to meet certain labor laws. And you can uh, instead outsource that labor to another nation when you don't have uh, to worry about these tariffs, and it's going to be easier to do so. Uh, we think that when you're able to do that, you're going to uh, have actually an incentive for these nations to do so. Uh, there's going to be uh, incentive for uh, the outsourcing of these businesses because you're, it's going to be cheaper over there. You're going to see that there are greater uh, profit margins when you're able to uh, go and do everything over here for cheaper, uh, even if it uh, hurts the economy, even if it uh, destroys their uh, nation, and even if it destroys the environment, uh, you're, it's cheaper over there. And so we have two main impacts coming out of that. The first is that you have the greater use of uh, things like sweatshops, uh, forced labor uh, that is not really able to be done uh, very easily in the United States uh, or other uh, more developed nations, uh, and it is going to be uh, cheaper for you to uh, invest in nations that you are able to get away with that, that you are able to uh, get that kind of labor pushed forward uh, and you're able to make more profit off of it. Uh, we think that's incentivized in the government's world. Uh, second of all, it's going to create uh, worse environmental standards because they often don't have the same kind of regulations just by the fact that they don't have the infrastructure to be able to support that. Ben's going to expand on that in his. So getting into developing nations. And I want to talk to you about Chile. Chile had a booming uh, manufacturing industry. They had actually 17, I believe, uh, car companies in their own nation. And when we removed tariffs back in the 80s, all 17 of those fell apart. And they got replaced by GM. They got replaced by American uh, manufacturing industries. They got replaced by these other company, or these other corporations from other nations. They're able to swoop in and take over their economy. All 17 of those fell apart within that developing nation. Uh, we think that when you have uh, free trade, uh, big corporations are able to enter the economy. And I think there are a couple of main impacts that come out of that. The first one is that it creates a dependence on these developing nations. Because when they swoop in and they uh, undermine your mom and pop business, and they're able to uh, kind of what we would call the Walmart effect, uh, you're able to come in, offer everything at a cheaper level in greater quantity, uh, and more it's more accessible for you. Uh, we think that is going to be uh, undermining the businesses that are already there who aren't able to compete with these giant corporations that have the money to do that. Uh, so you're not going to be able to sustain your own company, which means that you're forced to be dependent on the developed nations who are uh, coming in. We think that leads to more control from 
foreign corporations. And by extension, that means that there is more control from those foreign governments who control those uh, corporations because these nations aren't able to risk the loss of their uh, economy and their industry because they're controlled by that other nation. Second of all, we think that this leads to an in income inequality between these nations because they aren't able to, uh, these smaller nations aren't able to actually um, compete with the businesses coming from other nations. We think that it's going to be uh, far more difficult for them to compete economically uh, on a global scale, uh, being able to uh, actually get the kind of uh, profit margins in their own nations, uh, in their own companies, uh, because they're being overrun by these corporations from other nations. So we think that both of these are major issues that need to be addressed by the government side if they want to make the case that they are trying to make. So we think that it def destroys the local economy uh, in developed nations because it outsources it and it creates worse uh, situations for the people that are working these industries and are uh, trying to control the environment. And it destroys the developing nations, as we've seen in Chile, as we've seen in nations across the world, uh, that forces dependence and creates a greater sense of control by these nations. We are so proud to oppose. Thank you. Any reduction in tariffs will have winners and losers in the short term. That is to say that what they're saying is correct. For example, if a car manufacturer abroad can produce cars much cheaply and much in higher quality and then sell them in another country, people are likely to buy those cars and not the cars that are locally produced. But this debate can't be won by focusing on one winner and explaining why that, I'm sorry, one loser and explaining why that person is going to be harmed. You need to use comparative analysis to discuss why overall you're going to have a better outcome. And that's what we brought to you at Bella, right? We told you in general overall, these are the structural reasons why if you lower tariffs, most, I mean, every individual is going to get better quality goods and cheaper goods and how that directly results in the quality of life for those individuals. So our case, in the short term, even if certain individuals that are working in those car companies are harmed, broadly that entire nation is benefited by having cheaper goods and being able to have more disposable income, for example, to get more educated, to handle emergencies and basically have a better quality of life. It follows that I'm going to explain to you three things in my speech. Firstly, why governments make decisions, why the winner and losers, for example, aren't economically rational, again, not responded to the point from Bella, and then go through the winners and losers exactly and explain why in the long term you're likely to have more sustainable and just better economy overall and not the illusory economic success you have when you subsidize companies and try and prop them up. And then finally deal with how this in the broader term deals with better, more sustainable production and why that's most important in, in, you know, in coming economic scarcity and resource scarcity. But before this attack, this, this random attack on the, our model, right? Like, Firstly, just to note, like it doesn't really matter the model uh, for the, uh, as, to, to the model as much because all our benefits are generally what happens when you lower tariffs. All we're saying is that this is how it's likely to happen, the way that the WTO already works, and any sort of method of how you know free trade and tariffs are going to be reduced has to happen generally through that model because that's how tariffs are reduced. So if they think it's going to happen a different way, they need to actually prove to us what that comparative is. And so far, we haven't heard that or any analysis as to why that is less like more likely to happen, or also why that's going to be different to an extent that it's going to be bad, right? So that's out of the uh, debate right now. But in generally, in terms of why developing countries are likely to be heard, we on our side say that developing countries actually do not need to be heard as much. Because we've given you a lot of analysis as to how de developing countries and the particular capture that happens in this country, given that there's very little democratic accountability, means that their demands sometimes aren't the best in the best interest of their people. We think free trade in general is best for their people. I think we've definitely proved that at first with no response. Moving on then, why do government make, go governments make this decision? So I've already told you why. In the long term, we think you're going to get much better outcomes in, at Bella's speech, and I'm going to talk about that more in my second point, but let's deal with the short term and who wins, right? So their first point was that, oh, you get local growth, and therefore that growth is good because those, co those companies in that area are propped up. 
On our side, we say those companies, first of all, being propped up by the, by the government means that other people have to bear a cost, right? Either those individuals will have to buy higher, less, less quality or higher priced goods, which means that harms them individually, or the government subsidizes those goods so they're at a lower price, but that subsidy comes directly from taxpayer money and could otherwise have been spent on other things like healthcare and education. So there's a direct cost to the local economy by propping those institutions up just to help a certain group. Now, that would be fine if that group was actually a good group that we need to be helped, but we want to give you an analysis as to why often these governments making this trade-off actually don't do it for economically rational reasons. We've told you why corruption and lobbying happens that certain industries that definitely shouldn't be propped up are propped up. Think about in Southeast Asia, where car companies in Indonesia are just randomly inflated in their co costs, for example, and propped up, even though it should actually be centralized, for example, in Singapore, they can produce cars way cheaper. And that kind of attitude there means you don't actually get the proper economic rational uh, investment. No, thank you. But also it's based on things like who votes, for example, and swing voters in the area that usually are poorer individuals and, for example, need agricultural subsidies. We think because th these individuals want to be in agriculture because that's where they've been for the l most part of their life, have a pressure on the government to do so. And the government actually cater to those individuals, even though the more economically rational thing to do would be not to uh, prop up those industries and diversify and move from an extractive in economy to a service economy. We think that's stopped on, in, in their side when the governments are allowed to do this, uh, do, do, get, intervene in the government that, like that. No, thank you. But even if, even if these industries were good industries that need to be propped up, we think that there's a natural cap there. There's a natural cap because these industries are fundamentally not productive in that area. There's somewhere else that can do it much better. So the long-term effects on our side is to say that those companies don't work, you diversify, you go into other companies where you have a comparative advantage, that means everyone in the world actually is benefited in the long term because individuals are able to reskill into those areas and that is where our benefits come from. Let's talk about lo the local economy dealing with a lot of what opening opposition brought to us. Well, first of all, all these things, no thank you, aren't actually solved. Let's talk about developed countries in terms of sweatshops, right? This is not part of this debate. There's already an incentive for developing countries to let multinational companies come in and use their cheap labor. That is not part of this debate. People don't, developing countries don't put tariffs up against big companies coming to use their cheap labor. They actually encourage it. So that's not something that they can hand on their side. But also it's not really clear why when you remove free trade and you remove and you increase tariffs that sweatshops still won't exist in those areas. You don't actually improve the local the wage laws and the local standards of employment in those areas. That is not a benefit they can have. As I've already talked about in terms of developing countries and companies falling apart, we think that's a valid trade-off, I'll take your point in a minute, because when you do that and a big company comes in and, out and replaces the car company that was already there, the workers still have, sorry, the workers still have a place to go to, to work. The difference here is that those areas, the money coming in from abroad, gives those individuals higher wages, probably run more efficiently, people are able to upskill by learning from that company, but also this frees up the government subsidies to be used somewhere else, which results in a net benefit to everyone there. In income inequality, I have no idea how this even matters here, because you're, if at all on our side, getting more money for the exact analysis that I've already provided, and you can use that in healthcare and so on. This dependence isn't a bad thing if you're currently depend on, dependent on the government. The moment there's an economic shock, your companies are going to be uh, out of business because they are fundamentally unproductive and not economically rational. Finally then, overall, how do we get better sustainable production? Now this is important given the resource scarcity on Earth right now, the amount of lithium we have and the kind of demand for that. We want to move away from wasteful production. The US, for example, throws away one third of their food surplus because it is completely useless. We think we can make, make much better use of our land, much better use of global supply chains so we don't overproduce and waste our resources in inefficient production. Winners and losers exist in the short term we think the winners and losers are badly picked by local governments. Overall, we win. Honorable panel, there are winners and losers. 
went free trade and the WTO reigns free with no regulation upon it. And those losers are everyone in the short and the long term when environmental regulation is undercut by uh, burgeoning free trade. I'm going to get into that uh, a lot more <coughs> in my first point, but first I'm going to do some refutation, a little bit of uh, rebuilding on Solomon's point of economic harms, and then getting into how environmental environmental regulation is a barrier to trade. Okay, <coughs> first on talking about the how local growth is a direct cost on the local economy and that corrupt companies stay longer. The biggest problem with this is understanding that this is not exclusive to local economies. It also happens within the WTO and certain industries within that as well. We think that there's different rules for different industries and that is influenced by the most influential uh, companies within those industries and the rules that they get for certain, within certain uh, countries and on certain products. Next, on how sweatshops aren't a part of this debate, but we can tell you quite clearly that free trade is linked to more outsourcing to less regulated places which have worse labor laws, which have worse environmental laws, which cause more pollution in the long term. We think that that's a very clear link there, and I'll get to more about it. But what they didn't do is they didn't address, uh, address what Solomon said about how this creates a dependency on Western corporations to control those developing nations, and now uh, places like the US and the UK can say, we're going to pull out our financial institutions out of Hong Kong and totally destroy Hong Kong uh, by not having those banks there anymore and things like that. That sort of thing is very possible. Now getting into a little bit of rebuilding on Solomon's points of economic harms and adding a couple of examples that are important to this. Now talking about, <coughs> Solomon told you about less ability for small companies to compete. But what he didn't tell you, and something that's very important here, is there are several industries that would clearly harm, like these, co these countries are known for these industries. And it's a mischaracterization for OG to just come up here and say, oh, well, they'd be better off you know, not propping these up anyway. Let's talk about the French wine industry, where a lot of the Champagne region of France, if they stopped making these wine lakes, and if they stopped subsidizing these, like, there are two options if joining this free trade agreement on wine, either they stop subsidizing and totally lose that entire industry to cheaper places um, like the Napa Valley, or they dump tons more money into keeping that economy afloat. We think that either one is a lose for France, and that's a good example of a developed nation that would not do well. Another one, here's, here's another major example, is not all companies play by, or not all countries play by WTO rules, and they're not very strictly enforced, especially upon ones with more money and more power. Let's talk about Emirates Airlines, where uh, the UAE clearly, very clearly subsidized this airline, building their terminal for them, and doing many other things like that, and absorbing costs that most airlines would have to pay themselves. How is that bad? Well, this shows that not all companies and not all countries are playing by WTO rules and there's very like lax enforcement on some of them. Now getting into probably the biggest thing of this debate, the biggest thing to remember is that environmental relation, environmental regulation is a barrier to trade like on the whole. We think that this is very important to note because with the WTO they have a very terrible track record of what they've done with environmental regulations and their incentives towards deregulation deregulation of especially uh, developing nations and resource collection industries. Now getting into how this sort of deregulation actually harms environmental progress. So there will always be a country with looser regulations on how much you can put into the air, how much you can put into the water, and where your byproducts go, and how much you have to pay to get rid of those. There will always be a cheaper way to do it. So in a free trade world, corporations have an incentive to find the cheapest place or the place where they can pay off people the easiest to do business as cheap as possible um, in those countries. I've got three examples, but first I'd love to take uh, a POI from either side. Bottom. We think that not only is it important to remember that it's, it doesn't solve all the problems to have them linked. In fact, it can create problems. Um, if you look at like Bolivia and Venezuela, 
uh, and their trade and Venezuela literally stopped paying for the milk that they were sending them, it can actually cause problems. So I'd love to see that actually be an argument. Now, getting three examples on how the WTO has directly harmed environmental regulations. First, the first WTO panel declared that the US, the US Clean Air Act requiring cleaner and more filtered gas to be sold in the US completely illegal. They threw it out. Second, is they declared that the uh, Endangered Species Act requiring shrimp to not be caught in a way that hurts um, sea turtles was illegal as well. That was thrown out and not allowed. Third, a de they deregulate, they're just very incentivized to deregulate natural resource extraction, such as fishing, such as logging, water and energy, not just in the vulnerable developing world, but also in the US, in developed nations. They are like directly working against what environmentalism is trying to do. Why is this so important? Because it's the most crucial and timely impact in this round panel. The US climate directive showed that we've passed five out of 10 points of no return in trying to work against climate change. Se second, the developing world is clearly being exploited for resource uh, extraction before they're able to set up regulation. And so if you weigh the two of cheaper access to goods and more disposable income that we're going to have to spend on relocating massive swaths of population and clean air masks because we polluted the world, we would weigh those against um, the environmental harms and the harms of outsourcing such as more inequality and resource exploitation, exploitation that you see happening in Gov's world. We think that it's very clear that you don't want a world that's going to be uh, undercut and have no environmental re regulations because there will always be a cheaper, um, less regulated place to do business, but rather you would have um, local economies growing that are also regulated and not able to uh, exploit their workers and take advantage of the environment. Thank you.
Ready? The problem with this debate so far is it seems like all of the other teams have neglected to analyze how this was